Hello again. Delighted you can join us for another walk down football's memory lane. For the next half an hour or so, we're going to look back at one of the most remarkable title wins of all time. But what turned Leicester City from a side threatened by relegation to champions of England in just a few short months? Well, the man in the box next to me might be able to help answer that question because his arrival in the East Midlands helped turn everything around. Robert Hooth, thank you very much for joining us. Good to speak to you, Ernie. Hope you're well. Very well. How are you? How are you coping with, with the situation at home right now? Yeah, surprisingly well. Um, kids are making the most of it. Um, and it's kind of fun to get, not to know your kids again, but just to spend a lot more time with them and just being a lot more relaxed with not having the, the, the schoolwork to think about. And, and the weather's nice, so we get to play a lot of football in the garden, which is, which is great. <laughs> Every cloud. OK, so let's go back then uh, to that season. Well, let's put it into context. You, you arrived a few months before the start of that season on loan. So how did that come about? You're a two-time Premier League winner with Chelsea. You've been at Borough, at Stoke. How did the move to Leicester initially come about? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound too glorious, does it? Um, but believe me, the choice wasn't that big at the time. And it was almost, you know, Mark Hughes taught me at the time that had, we played Leicester twice in the season. So if I went there, I wasn't a threat Um to Stoke at the time, which is crazy thinking, because I'm not exactly a goal scorer or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, at the time it was it was a couple of Champions League club, uh, championship clubs, and Leicester were interested. So, um, I was only 30 years old at the time, so just thought you give it a crack. Um, from what I've seen of them, they're, they're a good team. I just need a bit of help, a bit of luck, and yeah, so I made my decision just to to go there for six months. Did you think you were joining a side who were going down, or did you think there was enough quality there to stay up? A bit of both. Like you're gonna have to be realistic, and you know, you know, I think they were seven, eight, nine points behind the safety, so it was looking more like relegation. But you know, the one thing you do know as a sports person is you just never know sports, you know. And as it happened, we turned it around pretty quickly um, and sort of kicked on from there and finished pretty well, actually. Yeah, seven wins in nine games. All of a sudden, you can start to look forward to next season. So at that point, was it an easy decision for you to make to make the move permanent? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you're talking about a good fit. Like, literally, I stepped through the door at Leicester, and it, 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 even even if Leicester went down, I would have been pretty sure I'd stay there and sort of try to get him back up. But I got on with everyone straight away. Um, and the way I say get on, I don't mean like we're all best friends, but it was a good professional fit. Um, I got on with the manager. He respected my needs, what I needed as a player at the time, you know, after all the injuries. So, um even before five games to go, there, there were always talks about coming or staying at Leicester for for the next three years, yeah. So who were the, the natural leaders in that dressing room? Is, is that why Nigel Pearson brought you in? Did he see you as, as someone to come in and help mould that team, bring everyone together? Um, he hasn't said as much, but because like when you look back through the squad, that not many players have played in the Premier League. Um, to that year, so it was all you know. It's a it's a big step up for some of them. So when I first met him, yeah, he did say um, that's what I want you to do. You know, just to be a bit more than you know senior figure, uh, not in terms of my age, but just in terms of having played in the Premier League and um, less than the time. I'm really unlucky to lose. You know, one nil, two one. You know, close games lost, and the margins were so small in that year that you know it just needed a little bit of luck here and then. And yeah. We just got over the line, which was absolutely amazing at the time. So that summer, aside from your arrival on a permanent basis, the one obvious big difference, Claudio Ranieri came in. Were you surprised that Nigel left? Yeah, um, well, not just that. I was surprised I later left it. Because um, obviously, once your season, defini- your season finishes, you get your training programme, you get your dates when you meet up. And I think it was a, a, literally a day before we met up for pre-season. That the news broke that uh, Nigel got relieved of his, of his duties. Um, and I just remember the group that got going, I can't believe this has gone on, you know, what are we going to do? Um, so, anyway, which uh, credit to, to Nigel, the backroom staff was so well set up that we just kept going and went through the training regime with our, with our manager for, you know, a good two or three weeks, I'd say. Um, Craig and Shakespeare took the sessions, the fitness guys took the ses- sessions. And we just got on with it without having a manager. Um, so we did that for about two, three weeks. We went away pre-season. Then obviously we got the news that Claudio was going to take over while we were still away. Um, but yeah, it's strange. I've never experienced um, a pre-season without a manager. But yeah, we just coped and 
midway through the preseason, we we had Claudio come in. So, what's your first reactions then? What, what do you make of Claudio? Would you would you have met Claudio at Chelsea, or did you arrive just after he left? No, no, I had, I had two years with him. Uh, he gave me my, my, deb, my debut actually at 17. Um, and to be honest, like when I heard the news that he was going to join us, I wasn't overly joyed with it um, because when he was at Chelsea, you know, that would have been 2003. I mean, the training, uh, you talk about tough training, that was tough. And I was only 17, 18, 19 then. And, uh, by that point, I would have been 31 in the summer. And I thought, if he trains like that for the next three years, <laughs> I'm not going to make it. Um, but funny enough, he just turned up. We've obviously learned a lot over the 10 years, 12 years he was away from, from English football. And he just observed for the first week pre-season. He didn't take one session. He just looked. He looked how we behaved, how we interacted with, the, with each other, um, how we responded to training. And just watching, I was going, why is he even here? <laughs> He's just, it's just met this, this sort of manager just walking around, not doing or saying anything, and just... It felt strange for the first sort of week, 10 days. Um, and once the training camp finished, we went back to the UK and then right, he's observed it all and he's sort of trying to, to step up. Uh, so what happens between then and that first game of the season? What were your first impressions of Claudio once he starts getting his, uh, his hands properly on the team and starting to do what he wants with you? Did he change much? No, I mean, time, time sort of ran out because we only had uh, a couple of pre-season games um, that we needed for fine-tuning um, so it's like any chance you're gonna do something um, and he said listen everything is working well from what I've been seeing you know I don't want to come in and do drastic changes um, and if you sort of keep doing well then you know what's why am I have to change things around if, if things go well so the most of preseason games we played with similar formation a couple of new players came in Okazaki came in Christian Fuchs came in and he sort of just let us get on with it most of the time. If things need need tweaking, and obviously it would have changed, but um, so hence he didn't really change the the team from the year before. By you know, apart from like I said, Okazaki and and Fuchs. And then once the first season went and we won, you know, quite comfortably against Sunderland, it's like well, you know, don't change a good thing. Um, and yeah, we just kept on rolling. And that kind of set the tone for the, for the season, really, because he had this reputation, didn't he, as, as the tinkerman. But mm. with Leicester, it was almost as if he, he was the complete opposite, didn't make changes. And I think the first 17 games of that season, you scored every game. So was that something that he, he actively wanted you to do, to be an offensive side, to go out and score goals? No, I think he sort of, he not, not fell onto his feet, but, you know, like, I think he just learned to to let it be, you know, like, because why change a good thing? I think he was kind of keen to, to sort of adapt to his style a little bit. Um, but credit where it's due, he went, you know, I let it go, um, give it a couple of weeks, and if things don't sort of stay as they are or improve, then I will change, which he did, to be fair to him, because, like you said, the first sort of six, seven, eight games, we were amazing going forward, but we weren't so good defensively. Um, which was obviously great for the first two or three games because you're riding a wave, you're going, oh, this is amazing, winning at home 4-2, which is great for the fans, but from a team's point of view, it's, you know, it's not sustainable, really, is it, to keep conceding two goals, three goals. And, and we've been playing really well, to be honest, but um, we had a couple four, you know, we had Richie Lapp going on the right, Jeffrey Schlupp, and they were as great as they were going forward. You know, they sort of, we didn't have the protection on the way home. Um, and most of the goals we did concede, concede were sort of from that wide area where we were great going forward, but teams starting to explore us. Um, all of a sudden, it just clicked. We still had the strength going forward with an extra couple of players that kept an eye on on, on the way home. Because, like I said, conceding two goals as a defender most of the games is not fun. chips away, your eagle put it this way. You don't have that clean sheet yet. Is that something yeah. that you see? Is that, does that I bother want you? to pay a pizza. But my players doesn't want pizza. Maybe they don't love a pizza. Because I said, when we make clean sheet, I pay to everybody a pizza. So you finally get, uh, it was Palace, wasn't it? A 1-0 win. Yeah. Boring 1-0. What does Claudio say? What's the reward for you after that? I thought, I've not seen the happy that, uh, apart from that game. I mean, he was happy with us winning, don't get me wrong. But with him being an Italian, a clean sheet is as, as good as scoring 10 goals, I, I can imagine. So he was absolutely buzzing and... Um, I just remember he took us out for a bit of pizza making, 
just a bit of team bonding, just to make sure it wasn't a one-off thing. So you carry on this run, I think, uh, what, two defeats in the first half of the season, scoring goals for fun. What did you make of Jamie Vardy? He was at 11 games consecutively. Uh, he scored, broke a Premier League record. Is that, was that the year when Jamie Vardy went from very good striker to superstar? No, I think it, it started off the, the year before because he was so important to us for at the end of the back end 14-15 season. Um, I mean, he didn't score as many goals at the end of that season, but the way we played, you know, we chase lost courses, get the team up, win a throw, win a free kick, win a corner and so on, which was essential for us sort of performing that, that year. But obviously coming into the next season, he, he started swearing away, he scored the first game of the season, scoring a goal. Um, and then, you know, like I said, he just went on an amazing scoring run. Um, you know, that sort of strikers do, don't they? They go on these sort of crazy ones, but no one would have thought he'd score 11 in a row. I mean, you must be so confident when you've got someone in that kind of form up front, knowing that if you can get anywhere near a clean sheet, you must think we've got this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You, you would just sort of get onto like a, a clearance and make a goal out of absolutely nothing. To be honest, when he scored his 11th goal, I didn't even know he did. You know, like when you're just so on his own, like I didn't know until afterwards. Because um, like it was just so normal that Vardy would score every game that you just forget counting. And then by the end of the menu game, it's like, wow, wow, like, that's pretty good, especially when he, I think Ruben Nisto was trying to send a message that he broke his record. I mean, that's when we sat in the gym, that's pretty cool, mate. <laughs> like, well done. So when you got to, to Christmas and you were still top, you had a good start to the season, but, but title contenders were still probably not realistic? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we hit 40 points, which was obviously the target straight away when we started the season. Um, but again, Cloudy just kept, kept sort of creeping up the targets for, for the team. You know, he never said, you know, we had 40 points for Christmas. He'd never said, let's get to 60. He'd say, let's get to 45, let's get to 50. And that was the plan that sort of like kept the lads grounded. You've seen it so many times. Teams start really well the season, get to Christmas, get to points total, and then why do a massive dip. And um, we didn't. I mean, we had a bit of a dip over Christmas, drawing three games, I think, two or three games. But apart from that, I mean, you know, we after New Year, we just kicked on again. Um, and again, that was so important that Claudio and this, this staff sort of kept it real, you know, never got as excited or sort of arrogant. It was always, nope, we're here because of that, but we need to get five more points, three more points. And it's really boring to listen to, but it just works, it worked for us. The, the pressure only really came on after sort of January where we sort of got even better. So, so we go into the yeah. start of 2016, it was, uh, that was a really good run, wasn't it? I think it was eight or nine games on Beeston. But there were three games that, that really, I remember standing out when, when I thought from the outside, you went from you know, a side who might finish top four to all of a sudden a, time a, good, a team who could win the Premier League. And it was that run of three games, Tottenham, Liverpool, Man City. Uh, Tottenham, yeah. that was your goal, wasn't it? I know, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, I mean, yeah, we, like I said, we struggled a little bit over, over Christmas and New Year because the majority of players played all the, all the year through. Um, you know, the way we played was quite physical. So I think we had a bit of a slump over Christmas where we couldn't quite recover. But once we got to Tottenham, I think we were still sort of hanging on physically a little bit um, just by the sh sheer amount of games. But I remember that game, I mean, we were running the cost for, for a good 90 minutes. And, um, you know, like I was saying, football is an absolute smash and grab. And let me tell you, there's nothing better than a smash and grab. You could see the disappointment in the Tottenham players because they were the better team of the day, no doubt. Didn't didn't create that many chances, and we just I think I don't know if there's one or two shots on target or or game. Um, and one of them was obviously mine that went top corner, and you could like you could feel the energy in the stadium just being drained. Like the whole zone was like ugh, because they would have been a couple of points behind us. I think it would have gone equal or even above us um, but instead we we put five points between us and like that, that was a big chance miss for them and like I said for us it was such a massive lift just because the way we grinded it out as well it was a tough 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 away game cold wet windy cold yeah you know you name it um, but we toughed it out I mean we sit and change them after and go yeah that was great absolutely awesome and then you follow that up with a win against Liverpool. They beat yeah. you, haven't they, earlier in the year? So a bit of revenge there. What a performance that was. Yeah, they're beating us quite comfortably. Um, and remember, that was Boxing Day, they beat us, didn't they? Um, at, 
Enfield. Yeah, that was quite a humbling loss as well because they were a lot better than we were on the day. They should have been uh, a lot more. But you know, on a on a evening game at the at the KP, there's nothing better. You know, you have all day to prepare yourself for the game. You can have a nice little afternoon sh- sleep. You can be full of energy. And we just did that. We did to them what they did to us. We absolutely outworked them, outfought them, outplayed them, and yeah, ultimately, um, you probably remember that Vardy goal. You know, the Maris ball over the top. He latched onto it, and like like I said, he just like no one would have expected him to shoot. And next thing, it's the back of the net, and the, the stadium has gone absolutely, absolutely mental. Um, but that was, um, I'd say, one of our better performances of the of the season as well. Yeah. And then you followed that up again, Manchester City on the road. Yeah. Is it three yeah. one? And again, goal scoring hero was you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that was such a. I mean, they were obviously massive favourites in that game, and you know they had that sort of swagger. And um, yeah, a bit fortunate to concede a goal at the end, which was the only sort of downside by the end of it. But you know, not many times I scored two goals in a game, so. I was absolutely buzzing, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, could you see uh, among your teammates in the dressing room, was there, a, was there a shift change? Did you go from being the plucky underdogs to a team who, maybe not even just contenders, who are maybe the favourites to win the Premier League after that? I wouldn't say favourites to win it, but there's definitely a time in any sort of sporting career when everyone just sits down and realises, you know, you're going to have to grab the ball by his horn, as they say. And make the most of it because what you don't want to be is by the end of your career look back and go oh we nearly or we could have or we should have and yeah that's certainly after the mentality again there was sort of a strange atmosphere in the sense of right this could be it you know which like i said not many people get to win a cup a trophy or, or even you know finish in the top three or four so for all of us it was a big realization to go this is it this is it you know, we we could be in the books, history books, as they say. And um, yeah, and there was a quite no one mentioned it, but it sort of certainly a certain sense and attitudes changed. It was a bit more head down, fun bit of going to training changed a little bit, got a little bit more intense. Because you can see you can see the end goal that the games are coming down, the points are, the points kept staying the same. And everyone just keep ticking over, but it just got a bit more sort of race horse, you know, a bit more tunnel vision, don't look left, don't look right. Yeah, and it was, um, yeah, I'd probably say after that game, it was a bit more, right, come on, you know, this is it. Like like I said, not many people get to win stuff and get to sit here with you and talk about it. What was it like when you went to Old Trafford and you got the point which put you right on the, on the brink? Yeah, I mean, like I said, one thing sport teaches you is you don't think you're done till it's done. Like there was not one bit of my body that, like, because Tottenham played on a Monday night and that was the worst couple of nights I had. Just being at home, it's like, why can't I play for more? Why do you have to wait another two days about for it? And then, no, I mean, it wouldn't have been nice and we had a chance as well to win it at uh, Old Trafford. That was square where Okazaki should have, no, not should have, could have maybe got there at the end. and. And we could have won it there, which would have been even more amazing. Beating both Manchester teams away from home and being crowned champions there. But as it happened, we had to sit tight. And yeah, Monday about nine o'clock at night, things didn't look too good once Tottenham were tuning it up because I was about to get suspended. We had like three games left. I'm sitting there going, I let the team down. I'm like, oh my God, so I'm sitting in the house going, this is not happening. Um, so yeah, a massive sort of guilt for the first sort of 80 minutes of the game and then Chelsea scored 1-1, uh, 2-1 and then 2-1 and yeah, no bit so relief. Tough, tough old day that was. Were you at Jamie Vardy's house that night with the rest of the squad? So what yeah, yeah, time? we all, we all did. made a thing of it, uh, made up late afternoon, had a bit of dinner, yeah, and just sort of, yeah, braced yourself for the, for what potentially could, could happen. Um, still, none of us were, was expecting it, we fully expected to to go to the end, um, but yeah, I mean, afterwards was absolutely just, uh, yeah, I mean, you've seen the pictures, so it was just mad, had the mad with the supporters, and I just had a big party on it, well, I did for the next two weeks, really, because I was suspended, so it was even better <laughs> than me. 
how did it compare? Is that one better than the two with Chelsea? Yeah, for it? sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you're young at Chelsea, you sort of tend to think, oh, you're going to win another 10. You know, because I was so so lucky and so sort of fortunate to be in a position where I was in a position to win it. You sort of develop the arrogance of thinking, oh, yeah, this is all right. You know, even though I was in no position to even think that. But looking back, I didn't really appreciate it because, you know, it took me 10 years yeah. to get to the position again. You know, and it would have very easy never happened to me again but i'm put it down to just being young and very arrogant and thinking you're going to play 700 premier league games score 50 goals you know you don't really think about anything else you just think about that oh, this is normal but certainly it's not so when it came out the second time i definitely um enjoyed it a lot more on the third time so yeah enjoy it <laughs> So you have the nice house and it's it's become legendary. It's in folklore now, the, the nice at, at Jamie's house and out with the fans. What was the final home game like when you presented the trophy? Was that a bit bittersweet for you? Yeah, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Um, only because I felt a huge injustice for being banned because I think Michael Oliver was the ref at the time and he I got to read the report of the of the referee and he said had he seen the incident he would have sent me off. I'm like, there's no way he would have sent me off for the for that. So I don't know whether that would have been a bit of sort of conspiracy from the FA or whatever it was back in the day. But because I've seen incidents similar before in the past and nothing got ever no one's got punished. So I'm like, right, we obviously first. And uh yeah, I was just annoyed because you know, to get a guard of honour at home on the day you lift your lift the trophy would have been absolutely amazing. And I had to sit in the in the in the stands and watch it. Um, when really I felt I should have been on there because, well, I should have been. But I haven't seen Michael Oliver since. But if I do, I uh, have a hard road. <laughs> I'll put it this way. Do you know? But but to, to, in the history books, you're there in the picture in the full kit. Was that an easy yeah, decision? Yeah, kit. When I got four kit, you're right. <laughs> I was like, that's not, you can't celebrate in a tracksuit, can you? So I had to put the kit on. Just I went in 10 minutes before the game finished. Put, you put my shin pads on, put my boots on. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not bothered about the pictures or anything like that. It's more the memory. Um, that's more important to me. Kids were there, family were there, mum and, there, mum and dad were there. Um, and it doesn't get any better than having... Oh, what's Did, you Did you get any stick? Did you get any stick for going full kit? Remember John Terry obviously got. No, got no I think John Terry got the got the got the stick for help before me, so anyone after him would have been all right. <laughs> and um, uh, no, I mean seeing Andrea Bocelli sing at the stadium, we had the rain coming down, and once he started singing, you could see the rainbow behind. I mean, it literally didn't get any better. I mean, they say your wife giving birth is pretty good, but. Back to Dubai. <laughs> that was pretty <laughs> special. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, before before we wrap things up, do you? I mean, it was it was the most incredible season. Uh, I'm probably a privilege for all of us who who watched it as well as fans, the media. Was, I mean, to be a part of it, it must have just been amazing. Do, do you think it'll ever be done again? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and I hope so. I mean, that's that's why we all watch sport, don't we? We watch uh, Anthony Joshua fight against David Ruiz and it gets beat. That's what you watch sport for. You know, you don't watch sport for the favourites to win all the time. And I hope someone else will win it. You know, that's why that's why I like sport. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you play sport, it, you don't realise what an impact it has on, on the outside of the world. Because even now, it's been, you know, four years now, you still, people still look at you and, oh, and all you did was play football. But it does really change your, your life in the sense of, like I said, like the reason we're talking is because we did that. Um, and now I guess we'll be forever part of my life. And it, it's just starting to feel like good about it. You know, like before I was always a bit like shy and sort of embarrassed about it. But now it's a lot more easier to talk about it and sort of appreciate it when you're sort of out of it rather than still being in it. Fans still come up to you on a, on a weekly basis just to ask about it? Uh, just fans or just... You know, it's like people, you know, not just Leicester fans, just fans in general that go come over and just have a bit of a, that was awesome or 
I just sort of... It's probably life-changing for them as well, because you, you've taken Leicester City, who were who were looked upon as a, a small club in the East Midlands, probably not even as big as Forest and Derby historically. Yeah. Now, yeah. everyone knows. So even for those fans, they now support a, a winning club. Yeah, and it, it will be forever. You you know, you'll be forever part of sort of that era and you'll always be connected to, obviously, to Leicester for that. But yeah, I mean, people just want to have, you know, it's like when you go to a concert and you've got children, they just want to have a picture with someone famous for what they, you know, like a song or a movie or no matter how old it is. And I think football is very much the same that sort of people want to take a picture with a Premier League winner um, or just have a chat. For some reason, it's more special than than just a normal football player, you know? I don't get it either, but it just is the way it is. Very, very humble. Uh, Robert, listen, it's brilliant, brilliant chatting to you. Thanks so much for reliving it. It was one of the most incredible seasons ever. And I think we'll be talking about it for years to come. Yeah, probably the same time next year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh,